why is it so important to practice nasal breathing? Yes. So nasal breathing is, well, it's vitally important. People don't realize it. And for various reasons, one is like, we talked a little bit about the sleep. If you're breathing through your mouth, seems perhaps ironic, your airway is going to be narrower, more prone to collapse. And like we talked about, this is so prevalent. It's getting more prevalent. Uh, but breathing through your nose, we talked about nitrous oxide as well, mix, mixes the air with nitrous oxide, helps with uh, vasodilation. So likely to help prevent cardiovascular events, uh, filters the air, humidifies it, increases oxygen absorption in the lungs into the blood. So breathing through your nose is super important. And to me, super important in preventing sleep issues, because like I was saying, breathing through the mouth, one is, like I said, it's decreasing oxygenation, it's increasing likelihood of collapse, but then it's also disrupting microbiome, oral microbiome, which is important. It's drying out the mouth. It's that's going to definitely increase your chances of oral decay and just poor oral health in general. So it's, as like a dentist, you want to keep this shut, uh, especially when you're sleeping. And when I see a kid sitting at rest, like mouth open, breathing through their mouth, to me, it's like a classic sign that of a few things, but inadequate maxillary bone and mandibular bone, basically craniofacial bone development, where the nasal passages are not developed enough. And so they breathe through the mouth because it's easier and there's, there's constrictions in the nasal passages. So to me, it actually signals like early childhood malnutrition. And I, I, I always, the thought that goes through my head frequently is like, if we reclassified mouth breathing, for example, as malnutrition, or we classified what I think is great, like crooked teeth as malnutrition, parents would be like, oh my goodness, my kid has got crooked teeth. They're malnourished. And a lot of this happened, like the damage was done. So now we're trying to put the fires out, but people would start taking childhood nutrition a lot more seriously. If we didn't normalize teeth crowding and it was like, Hey, this is a result of malnutrition. Like your cranial facial bones didn't grow enough to fit all the teeth in them. That's why they're crowding. Wow. Uh, yeah. I think that would like change the paradigm around oral health and nutrition quite a bit, especially in early, early childhood, when I think it's the most important. That's such a good point. It's funny, in Brazil, in Portuguese, uh, if you call somebody a boca aberta, which is an open mouth, you're basically calling them an idiot. So it's almost like <laughs> built into the culture where like you, you can insult somebody by, by telling them they're, they're, they have their mouth open. And it is a, a direct analogy because they tend, people that have developmental like Down syndrome, tend to have poor craniofacial development. And so because of that, they, they can't, like their nose is so obstructed, they have to breathe through their mouth. Uh, so sad. And so that's, that's kind of probably where that parallel yeah. comes from. Yeah, it's so sad. Uh, you, you've been talking about sleep. Number six is prioritize sleep. What things should people be thinking about on how to prioritize sleep? Yeah, I think in the sub comments of that, of that tweet, I was like, if you focus on one through five, six takes care of itself. So if you do like the other side, the sleep's going to happen on its own. Uh, and that might be a far, a little bit of a stretch because there are some things that we're doing outside of that, that can damage our sleep. There's a few like big things that move the needle. One is like habituation for people that like tend to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, they tend to have better sleep. Um, and we've all heard like, if you want to limit the blue light exposure, dark, cool room. I agree with all this. <laughs> it does help. Uh, and, and yeah, so I, I mean, some of the things that everyone's heard a million times, those are good things. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing for good sleep is all the other things we just talked about nutrition, totally. exercise, you got out in the sun helps set circadian rhythms and the circadian rhythm is reinforced with, uh, you know, uh, it's called uh, sleep hygiene. So you're going to bed at the same time, waking up at a similar time. It's yeah. helpful. You get sun in the eyes. Like you open, you don't just, <laughs> bury yourself in a closet. Oh, the sun's rising. You see that like that helps set circadian rhythm. So, uh, yeah, sleep is a deep topic, but I think, you know, if we want to hit the big strokes, we did. <laughs> yeah, totally. And we talked to Amber O'Hearn recently about this. She's got some latest research on low carbohydrate diets and sleep and how it builds up that sleep pressure. And I believe sun exposure is a great way to do that as well. Like it's hard for me to stay up much past the time the sun goes down anyway. Like I'm, I'm tired, I'm ready for bed at that point. And it's, it's so much easier to wake up refreshed and feeling better for the next day. The very, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'm glad Amber's talking about that. I've seen a talk that she's done. She's great. Um, 
because a lot of people that switch to a carnivore ketogenic diet, sleep can be impaired early on uh, because the body does see it as like a stress response. I've been eating 60%, 70% of my food is carbohydrates for the last 30 years. And now there's zero. The body will see that as a stress that can impair sleep for a little bit before adaptation. So I am glad that Amber's out there who's, I think I consider her a, a, an authority in the space to help people through, through these sleep issues because it's important. Yeah, authority is such a good word to use when describing Amber. She's such a badass and so, yeah, so smart. <laughs> Number seven, the last one that you included, socialize with other seven percenters. I have the honor of doing that right now, which is great. You <laughs> had uh, the privilege to go down to Austin to go to KetoCon. What does it mean to be able to share these things with others who have similar beliefs and belief systems? So this kind of goes into a little bit of what we were talking about earlier, where you know, I, you know, I talked about a commitment device. You go buy a cow and it kind of commits you to eating all that meat, right? So it's going to force you to make the right decision. You make a hard decision once and it forces you to make the right decision again, and again, and again, and again. I love things like that. Uh, but having a social circle is like one, having one of those things all the time. And so I think of it as our environment shapes our behavior more than any of us probably would care to admit. And if we are around in our daily life, but around people that don't share the same health and fitness kind of priority. That's a constant tug of going back to their, their normal, our old normal that we're trying to escape. And I feel like the way the people that really escape that is they find another community that is going to have at least an equal pull, if not a stronger pull to reinforce like, Hey, this is normal to eat this way. It's familiar to be healthy and fit. Like and even more powerful is when you have peers that expect that out of you, because we tend to rise to the expectation of those around us. And so if you have five close friends that expect you to like be in the gym and to eat healthy, if you don't, you're kind of like letting down your peer group. It's hard, right? And so forming is the best you can associating with these quote unquote seven percenters is a way to kind of solidify yourself into the seven percent. And if you do nothing else, like if they skipped steps one through six here and just went to, Hey, this group of five people or seven percenters, they're going to let me in. You can do nothing else. And they will, you will get results because you will be pulled into their belief systems. You will see how they do things. You'll start eating like them, doing the things that they do. And like, it's probably if you had the easiest way to success, that's a way to do it. But finding that community and then joining it is, is, the, is the tough part, right? <laughs> and getting rid of the current community. Uh, wow. But it is, I think, one of the most, most powerful ways to cement change. Like we white knuckle our way to create change. And willpower works to a degree, but yeah. <laughs> it tends to be like, I only have so much willpower, right? Until right. it's gone. And so this is a way to get rid of the will willpower and keep results. I love that. That's such a great point. And thinking about the normal person who is in this world seemed average that 93% have the dad bods, they get sick, they have autoimmune issues, their the blood pressure, the medications. It's like you, you lose you lose a sense of what is normal for the sense of what is average and to be around other healthy people. You're like, wow, no, I can, I can live until 80 and 90 and be healthy and thrive and continue doing my life passion. It's, it's totally different to be around those people and you can really get a lot of energy and inspiration that way. So yes. I love that point. I think that's fantastic. I do want to ask you about your challenges that you do every single year for you. Why is it important to have uh, what is called like a beginner's mind? Why is it so important to do something that you're, uh, you know, not not great at i'm not going to say your first uh drawing was all that great sorry uh <laughs> mine would be much better but why is it so important to pick up something that you might not know a lot about or be very good at well i enjoy challenging myself and improving and i it's like kind of this i just enjoy it for quite frankly and like for the drawing i'd like I'd always like wanted to wish I could learn how to draw and people always assumed like you either are like a natural artist or you're not. And I didn't believe that. I was like, let's just challenge this belief and do a drawing challenge. And so, I mean, that's where it comes from. I'll tell you what I get a lot of value out of it now is, you know, I obviously talk and work with a lot of people around health and fitness and I am not out of touch with what it feels like to be a beginner and to struggle and to like not know what to do but I've been doing this health and fitness thing for over 20 years. So to me, it's very second nature. Like my diet is second nature workout. Like if someone asks me like how I work out, I'm like, oh, it's, a lot of it's just intuitive. That doesn't help anyone to tell them that my, I work out intuitively or I eat intuitively uh, because people that are beginners, they don't have this 
unconscious it's it's unconscious competence you know if there's this four stages of competence uh and ideally that's where people get like you could become unconsciously competent that's when there's no more willpower it's like this is it's a part of your identity it's natural it just happens uh but by doing these challenges i am consciously incompetent like i know how bad i am and in some senses i was unconsciously incompetent i didn't even know how bad i was i was worse than i thought i was uh and so i do like continuing to like push myself in different areas. I think it's a decent, I, I do these things because I want to do them, but also, you know, if it's helpful for other people on their journey, whether it's improving in health and fitness or other areas, whereas like the drawing, I, I actually, is one of my favorite challenges because it's just like, just start making small current steps, right? A lot of times we try and change everything all in one day. And that's like, it's, it's overload and people, and you're just like, I can't do all that much. So my drawing challenge was like, look, I'm going to practice drawing for at least five minutes a day. Okay. Like anyone, everyone's got five minutes a day, right? You could set the alarm five minutes earlier. There was no excuse to not be able to do that. And so that was the challenge. Just like, that's it. Five minutes a day. And now if I want to go, I, I like to say there's a floor, but not a ceiling. So some days I'd be like, Hey, I'm really in the mood. I'm going to do 30 minutes today or something like that. Uh, but so I start really small and I let it naturally grow in itself. And you know, my drawings got better and better throughout the year. And here I am four years later when was that 2019 or 2019 yeah it's over I've, I've been over four years that's my last drawing right there uh, so good <laughs> so, so it's good. like not only did did i improve which you know which is nice <laughs> you see so you see improvements as you go that's helpful for motivation uh but then I, i've been able to stick with it and like I'm not making money selling these artworks or anything like that it's i'm believe me i have a very full busy schedule uh <laughs> But to me, it highlights like you can do take small steps. And if you continue to make those small steps, they can add up to make big differences. Even if you are busy, even if it's not priority number one, you can get results in other areas of your life that you'd like to improve. So that's kind of at the core ethos of the challenges.